Robinson. He even went down the sideline and he's got Cass Decker bringing you UCLA football content all throughout the year for LA Football Network. What is up and welcome to a Monday night edition of the Bruin Bible. Will Decker, your host, joined by the man, the myth, the legend, fresh off a Vegas trip. This guy's been to Vegas twice in the last three weeks. Jamal Madney in the house. What up, Madman? It's great to see you as always, bro. Great to see you, brother. Uh, you know, missed you. Uh, it, we we had a show on Friday. It's been, you know, two and a half days, but I also went to Vegas. So it feels like it's been two and a half years. Uh, but it's not the same without my guy. Let me tell you, when we went to Vegas a couple of weeks ago, uh, you know, all the antics you and I did, that was, that was unreal, next level stuff. But a, a fun weekend. As you know, I'm I'm a huge tennis fan, and so I had the opportunity to go to the Netflix Slam to go watch Rafa Nadal and Carlos Alcaraz. So it was a wonderful time with friends, an amazing match. I was going crazy, lost my voice here. So if I'm sounding a bit hoarse, it was cheering for Rafa. A lot of vamos Rafas uh, over the course of the match, but a great time and great to see you as always, brother. Huge Nadal fan. Have I ever told you this story? So my brother was a ball boy uh, when they used to have a tennis tournament in Phoenix, Arizona. And this is like 2004, 2005 time. We didn't even know who this who he was at the time, but my brother actually got the ball boy for Rafa. And he like signed oh, a ball. Wow. Like really like got in the mix with Rafa. And like, he like was, you know, shaking his hand. He like put his hand on their, my, my brother and his friend's head. And just like, they took a picture together. And that's something he's got for the rest of it. Like he literally ball boy and one of the coolest tennis players of all time. So I thought, I thought that was a very cool story, but dude, I mean, Vegas, can't go enough. You know, we will probably be out there again sometime soon. It sounds yeah. like in our near future. It's getting problematic right now, Will, because I'm starting to like spot. Like I know exactly where restaurants <laughs> are now. Like I know where the start, like the third Starbucks on the right is. I'm like, man, I'm getting way too familiar. This is a problem now. I'm starting <laughs> to acknowledge the first step. It, in in getting rehabilitated is acknowledging the problem. I think I'm starting to acknowledge problem. the problem here, Thriller. You know. <laughs> yeah, man. I I would have to admit I've got a problem with the s'mores out there too. That we race <laughs> for for like two miles trying to get those, but that's a story for a different time, man. And Thriller, the last thing I'll say is I am still so heartbroken as a massive tennis fan that Novak Djokovic was at UCLA last week and I missed him, but it sounded like it was an absolutely epic time. Djokovic got to do, do some training here with, with some guys on the team and then students <laughs> were packing the crowd. Only at UCLA, Thriller, all the goats come to UCLA. So had to throw that one in there. But I haven't slept well in the last three or four days knowing I missed Novak the Great uh, at, in Westwood. We've texted about it a couple of times, man. The disappointment <laughs> is palpable through those text messages. My guy need to see Novak. He'll be there the next time he comes out, though. Mad Men, serious note right now. Let's talk about huge hires, huge overchange within the coaching department. Tim Drebno out, and in comes Juan Castillo, a guy who is a football lifer, it feels like. He's been coaching at the college level since 1982, has spent 20-plus years in the NFL Another Andy Reid disciple back from his Philly days coming over with the enemy. He was a 13-year coach of the offensive line in Philly. That's kind of his bread and butter. You know, Juan Castillo, I read a lot of articles on Castillo leading up to our podcast. And this is a guy that's grinded for everything he's got in life. He grew up in the San Padre Islands in South Texas. You know, his father passed away at a young age. His mom had to work multiple jobs trying to keep the lights on in there. And this guy through hard work and cultivating his love of football, gave himself a shot at being a coach. And the first job he had was Texas A&M, University of Kingsville. But this guy, man, he, his bread and butter was the offensive line. He was famous for that Division II school. He put four offensive linemen into the pros. He was a stalwart with the Philadelphia Eagles. He got Jason Peters to be an all-pro tackle with the Eagles. This guy is a phenomenal hire on the offensive line. Talk to me about your excitement on Juan Castillo and also talk to me about Tim Drevno and what went wrong, you know, specifically in year number two after such a promising year one 
bring at UCLA. No, Will, I think, again, with Juan Castillo, this is another home run hire here by this staff. And I think Castillo brings, again, three elements to the table here that I'm just so excited about. One is deep domain knowledge. I mean, when you talk about a career that he's built at a singular position, that is a rarity, Will, to, to sort of be so focused on one position for the vast majority of your career and focusing on offensive line for the better part of three to four decades. And so you know he checks the development box in a significant way. Then when you talk about his ability to be associated with Andy Reid, look, those Donovan McNabb-led Philly teams, we all forget, those were four consecutive NFC Championship games. Those were That was a Super Bowl appearance. Those teams were known for having very strong offensive lines where McNabb could leverage the play action and that classic Andy Reid balanced offense could do what it needed to do to be successful. And Castillo was a huge part of that. So there's development. There's the pedigree of coming from Andy Reid. And then again, there's the name recognition of now when you go out and recruit and you say, look, I know exactly how to play at the highest level in the NFL. I've seen it. I've been around it. I've been around the best coach in football today, and I understand what it takes. And so when you put all of that together and then you overlay that, of course, with the familiarity now with an Eric Bieniemy, given that he's going to presumably run very similar branches off of that Andy Reid offense, now you've linked up the offensive coordinator with the offensive line coach in a very significant way. And so this running game, yet again, should be very seamless in terms of its coordination, in terms of its productivity moving forward next year. So I'm absolutely thrilled about this. And there is absolutely nothing better, Will, than to have a lunch pail, blue collar grinder uh, as a, on your coaching staff across all your positions, but particularly that offensive line. And so Juan Castillo, I don't think the Bruins could have done any better than Juan Castillo. I'm so excited to see, Will, how his philosophy gets injected right away in the next couple of weeks when we go out and see the team in spring. Because we talked about this at nauseum over the course of the last seven, eight, nine months. When we went last spring to watch this team prepare, there was a glaring deficiency at the offensive line. That was the one position where we felt it could have been the linchpin to the whole season, and guess what had happened? And the lack of productivity with that offensive line, the lack of development over the course of the season, ultimately cost stability at quarterback, ultimately cost stability on the offense, and that led to losses that should not have taken place, primarily against Arizona State and Cal. So bringing Castillo in, I think you're going to see a total shift in terms of weight room philosophy nutrition philosophy, and then I think the mechanics of leveling up sort of your center of gravity, your use of your hands, and I think we're going to see a much more physical offensive line, an offensive line that's going to be very a lot more comfortable on that interior as well as more athletic laterally to be able to deal with kind of the bull edge rushers. So very excited about Castillo. I think it was coming, Will. Drevno obviously had... Uh, some really nice success, particularly in the 22 season, where it was a similar story, where the offensive line sort of started uh, at, at point A and was able to evolve to a strength of the team in 2022 that ultimately led to a terrific offensive season. But I think in hindsight, that had a lot to do with the roster that was already in place in terms of Mafi and Gaines. Um, and Anderson and whatnot, guys that were either pros or fringe pros that ultimately just kind of grew into their bodies, grew into the game, the game slowed down for them. And so then the question became how much of that evolution was Drevno and how much of it was his successor? And I think 2023, because we never saw the offensive line turn that corner that we were expecting, we were like game four, game five, game six. If they're able to turn that corner, this team can really go somewhere. That corner was never turned in a, a subsequent year in the system. And so Drevno, a very fine coach, but this change needed to be made. And the fact that it was made with Castillo and all his credentials, Bruins yet again with a Grand Slam hire. Grand Slam. And, you know, with what 
Castillo is going to be able to bring to the table is alignment. And I heard this through the combine. Uh, John Middlecoff does a really good podcast on NFL football for the volume for Colin Coward. And he highlighted three teams. He went the Ravens, he went the Chiefs, and he went the 49ers. And he goes, what are these teams? Yes, they're successful on the field, but what makes them successful? It's alignment. I mean, you're talking about the wants to instill an offense. Who's he bringing along with him? Juan Castillo, who was the run game coordinator for the commanders last year. They already have a formed relationship. They know exactly what they want to do on the offensive side of the ball. It's cohesion. It's making sure everyone's on the same page. Drevno, for you know all of his strengths, I thought the first year he was on campus, he did a phenomenal job. You know, I'll be the first to say it. The Neo Mafi, him getting him to his yep. ceiling, that was very impressive coaching because he had switched over to the offensive line position, you know, two years prior. He made a jump. Even John Gaines, a guy who I thought was a fringe NFL player, he turned him into a legitimate NFL prospect that year. So I want to give all the credit for 2022. The regression in 2023 was very, very evident. We got transfers in there that should have helped. We had DiGiorgio. We had one of the top five to ten best centers in the country in Duke Clemens. They just were never there. There was only ten teams in the country, Madman, who you know allowed more sacks than UCLA did last year. Like That's yeah. the real fact. 122 out of 133 teams in sacks. So it was just a lot of chaos. And I mean, turn on the tape against Utah. I mean, it felt like players were in the backfield every single play on that. We had struggles and not to point fingers or point names. Bruno Fina really struggled on that, you know, left and right side. I and mean, we there was just nothing we could do to really figure that out. Jake Wiley underwhelmed, you know, Holstege, the guy we were very excited about yeah. underwhelmed. So there's just a lot of things we felt he could have done better on and bringing in a guy like Castillo, where I feel like his pedigree speaks for himself. He's a football lifer. He's been coaching for over 40 years at the college and pro level. By the way, his most recent stint in college was 2019, not too long ago, at the University of Michigan, who just won a national championship. If you want to learn about culture, go to University of Michigan and see what Harbaugh was cooking up, who's now with the Chargers. So this guy knows what it takes. Everyone's aligned on the same page. There's a lot of great stuff going on with Juan Castillo, and I'm excited to see what he makes the offensive line. Drevno did a good job of recruiting offensive linemen this past season, but it was kind of a little too late for me as someone that watches UCLA, because I think it was going to take a few more years before it really got good again. Castillo gives us a chance to really remodel this whole thing, man. So no, I lot. totally agree, Thriller. Yeah. It was it, it's such a great point that you made about alignment and cohesion. And I think we have to sort of address that a little bit further because it was such a phenomenal point. It's so hard to achieve in today's game because there's so much fluctuation and movement with coaching staffs on a year-over-year -year basis where anything you can get, where you get that alignment and cohesion, it's gold. Because at the end of the day, offensive football and defensive football, or particularly offensive football, is structured choreography. And you have it, the more in sync that structured choreography can be on a more consistent basis, on a more enduring basis, and on a more clean basis vis-a-vis -vis penalties, the more successful you're going to be. It's that structured cohesion is so important and can actually overcome, in a lot of ways, certain talent deficiencies at certain positions. Whereas if you have a super talented team and they are not cohesive, look, you we've seen examples of that every year. Teams that should be in the top 10, top 20, top 25 absolutely flame out because of that lack of cohesion, because of that lack of continuity. So the fact that the enemy brought someone he's very comfortable with who understands this overarching system, the nuances of the system, the variability of the system, and is able to get that structured cohesion in continuity from day one is absolutely vital. So, and I think to your earlier point, Will, with Drevno, look, a couple factors went against him. I think anytime you have a new offensive coordinator and a new coach, you're going to have turnover. They're going to want to bring, quote unquote, their guys, their people, the ones that they've been in the trenches with, the ones that understand their principles and methodologies, the ones that they have quietly observed and respected either directly or indirectly for a number of years. So, Drevno was always, I think, going to be in a position where it would be tough for him to come back. Having said that, I think what didn't help, to your point, is this regression from 22 to 23. There's really no reason when you're a position coach that you should have such a steep regression from one year to the next when the talent has relatively been the same or, if not better, 
given what you were able to get. When how you think about Mafi, how you think about gains, but then you kind of get a whole stage and you you get some reinforcements. Okay, that that's sort of comparable talent in terms of sort of raw prospect. The fact that you went so far down in terms of productivity and performance from 22 to 23 and your entire focus was just the one position that I think was the red flag as well that really sunk Drevno's fate. I think Drevno is going to have a real nice opportunity moving forward for a, a litany of teams uh, to be able to bounce back and, and have a really thriving career. But then it becomes a question. Well, how much of Mafi, how much of gains was uh, the impact of Drevno a and B, even if it was a significant impact, is he just a better kind of individual teacher than he is kind of a holistic position coach? So either way, you're bringing in questions. And I think that's probably the question that Eric bien had. And then when you sort of overlay that where I want to bring my own guy anyway, I think it made a lot of sense to be able to make this move. And here's just another thing that I think the Juan Castillo addition really helps with is we want guys to surround Deshaun Foster with that have been in these NFL rooms yes. that know what it takes to be the head man. I know Castillo has not been a head coach, but he's been probably the most trusted assistant of the Andy Reid era back in Philadelphia. He's been in rooms with John and Jim Harbaugh as he worked for the Ravens and he worked for University of Michigan, also worked for the Bills, also worked for the Bears, also worked for the Commanders. So he knows what he's talking about. Like if Juan Castillo has an opinion on football, that's a guy you're going to listen to. So he has all this perspective and knowledge and wisdom on the game of football. You blend that with the enemy and what they've learned. I can't think of two better mentors for Deshaun Foster as a head coach moving forward for UCLA. Jarman sticking to his word on this in terms of hiring guys that are going to directly help Deshaun, you know, make the gap of first year head coach a lot shorter than what it normally would be. So just in a phenomenal hire from Castillo. And then we get this hire out of nowhere, linebackers coach, 2001 Pac-12 Defensive Player of the Year for your Bruins linebacker, former first-round overall draft pick for the St. Louis Rams at that time. That's how long ago it was. It wasn't the L.A. Rams at that time, St. Louis. Robert Thomas, man. And the reason I like this one, there's two big reasons that stand out to me, Madman. One, I think the whole recruiting thing where people are, you know, hey, he's got to be a good recruiter. We need people to come in and recruit, blah, blah, blah. You want people that can sell UCLA in the best possible manner. So you're bringing Deshaun Foster, who loves UCLA more than anybody. You're bringing former players, Robert Thomas, back to campus trying to sell UCLA to other linebackers. I mean, this guy, you have to remember, I looked up his profile. This guy was the number one linebacker in the country. Could have gone anywhere, and he chose to go to UCLA. I mean, this guy is going to bring the energy and passion back. So you got Robert Thomas coming back, linebackers coach, who's going to sell the university like nobody can. You know, very few people can as a former player. And on top of that, Madman, this guy was the linebackers coach in modern day. What programs in Southern California do you want to start a pipeline to? It's St. John's Bosco and it's modern day. That's pretty much the top two of where you want to bring players in. I love the Robert Thomas hire on so many fronts. I think he's going to have to prove it. It's hard to lose a guy like Ken Norton Jr. But for those two factors, the selling the program as a former Bruin, as a former Bruin only can, and the fact that this guy has maybe a pipeline to modern day gets me fired up as somebody that covers the Bruins. What do you think, Madman? Well, you took the words right out of my mouth. And I've got a smile ear to ear because Robert Thomas growing up was one of my favorite UCLA players. Yeah. And I loved Robert. Give me some Robert Thomas. and. What's so special about this, Will, is when you talk about the connection of being able to build something great, Robert Thomas and Deshaun Foster were freshmen together on the 98 wow. team. Wow. And when you talk about that iconic 98 team that was on the back end of the 20-game win streak, the 10-0, and number three on the cusp of a national championship, their superstar radiant freshman on offense was Deshaun Foster, and their superstar radiant freshman on defense was Robert Thomas. And now, near 26 years later, they come together both as first timers in their role at UCLA yet again to revive this program. And so, I am ear to ear with this, Will, because at a, a linebacker position, You've got the knowledge, and I'll talk about the modern-day point in a second because it's absolutely significant, but you need high energy, 
you need someone who's been there and you need to be able to sell UCLA. And Robert Thomas can do that just as well as Ken Norton Jr. can because he can go and say to recruits, not only was I a top flight recruit in California in the high school pipeline, not only did I play in the league, but guess what? I was a star on my during my time at UCLA when this place was humming. I was there when UCLA was number three in the country in 98. I was there when UCLA was number three in the inaugural BCS rankings in 2001, my senior year when they started 6-0. and I have seen it. I have lived it. I have immersed in it when UCLA has been a peak football school. So this notion that UCLA can't be a football school is false. Because I actually lived it. And you know what? Who you know who else lived it? Your head coach lived it. And we we our four years were together, 9801. And we had an enormity of success together as players. And now we plan on having an enormity of success together as coaches. And how powerful a story is that, Will? Because recruiting at the end of the day, and we've talked about this, it's about authenticity, it's about connection, it's about passion, it's about trust, it's about integrity. And how better if you bring a Robert Thomas in the room with Deshaun Foster for them to say, we are Bruins. We've been successful as Bruins. We've been successful in the NFL because we were Bruins and we love UCLA so much that we're coming back. How do you match that pitch from the heart? You can have the best of coaches. You can have Kirby Smart. You can have Dabo Sweeney. You can have Lincoln Riley. You can go on and on the list. But from the heart, when it comes directly from a Bruin in those firsthand experiences, that is going to be so incredibly compelling. And then the second point, Will, and this is a huge one. You mentioned it, the modern day pipeline. And it's always been the case. There has always been this incumbent philosophy here in Southern California that Bosco is more of a UCLA school And modern day is the USC pipeline. The fact that now you have a very successful infiltrator into that USC pipeline to get tremendously decorated recruits is so significant here. And I have always believed that the key, the one timeless element in terms of college football is you have to wall off your local recruits. Obviously, recruiting is national. You have to look for talent elsewhere. But if you are next to a hotbed recruiting pipeline, you have to wall that off. That has to be the base of your competitive advantage. And so the fact that UCLA is prioritizing that is significant. The fact that they are leaning into wanting to take something that, quote unquote, historically has been SCs, I love about that. And the fact that they're doing it with someone who has coached right away at modern day, just most recently, I love about that as well. Modern day is going through a lot of transition in terms of their coaching staff the last couple of years, in terms of even administratively and culturally the last couple of years. So I think this is going to be a great opportunity for Robert Thomas to make this jump now and also talk about when modern day was extremely successful and bridge that relatability. This is such a huge win here, Will. And look at the common thread we're getting here. In, in the entirety of the coaches, you've got guys that are individuals of color and, and minorities. You've got guys that are Bruins. You've got guys with chips on their shoulder and a lot to prove, given previous experiences or lack thereof. And then you got guys who are all coming together because they want to build something from the ground floor. And so that is just such an inspiring coaching staff I mean, Will, it has been a home run after home run in terms of these ac- these acquisitions from a coaching standpoint the last four or five weeks. Martin Jarman and now Deshaun Foster have hit home run after home run. This is about as young, hungry, and exciting a coaching staff as we've had and the buzz around it than I would say since the mid-2000s when the offensive coordinator was Norm Chow and the defensive coordinator was Dwayne Walker. I mean, this is the kind of buzz I think we're going to start generating in terms of excitement with the coaching staff. So I'm ear to ear, Will. You said it so well. Yeah, Robert Tom is coming back, man. It's just, it fires me up. I think there's going to be Bruins showing love that only Bruins can as a whole. And it's just going to be a blast to watch this coaching staff take off. And for the people doubting the recruiting, I want to put this out there. 
we just got a visit schedule with five-star local quarterback. You know, you were talking about, you know, wall off the area, kind of what the 1980s Miami did, right, in terms of just protect the area, get the guys in. Houston Longstreet from Corona, California, five-star quarterback. Wasn't even thinking about UCLA before this. He is now taking a visit to UCLA, so keep your eye out for Houston Longstreet. Yes, I know we got Dante Moore a couple of years ago. Yes, DTR. Yes, we had Rosen, but – Finding that first guy to really come in and be the quarterback or the recruiter of the future is going to be huge for UCLA. So if they could somehow sway this guy to even consider the Bruins in a serious manner, I think it's going to be massive. Madman, this has been so much fun. We're going to have another special episode coming this week. Listen, guys, I know you guys love Wayne Cook coming on the show. We floated it out to him. I think Wayne may be stopping by at some point this week. We have, you know, some special ones coming up that we're very excited about. I hope you guys like the Chase Griffin one. This is what we do, man. We want to give you guys the best possible content for UCLA in the offseason. We're going to start doing position group, you know, previews for some of these guys. Let us know in the comments if you guys are wanting us to interview a particular player. You know, talk about a specific, uh, you know, topic for each episode. Let us know because we want to be, you know, accountable for what you guys can hear and, you know, have fun listening. So let us know. Bruin Bible, we are officially out. We will talk to you guys very soon. Madman and Will, fours up. We are out of here, guys.